Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network Room Week in Review for March 10, 2024. Today we're talking with Ms. Junik Arajanian. Hello, Ms. Arajanian. Welcome back. Good evening. Good evening. So let's begin the show by honoring a national hero. This is this week was the birthday of Vazgen Sarkisyan, the first defense minister of Armenia, who also served as prime minister of Armenia until his assassination in 1999. This was the 65th anniversary of the birth of the national hero, who is credited with building the Armenian army, uh, the same one that was later responsible for the victory in the first Artsakh war. And for that, he's referred to with the honorary title of Sparapet. And now it is quite ironic that as Prime Minister Pashinyan visits the grave site of the Sparapet every year for PR purposes. Um, it's ironic really on many grounds. Not the least being that as a young yellow journalist, Pashinyan frequently wrote smear pieces criticizing Sarkisyan. Uh, indeed, Sarkisyan was one of Pashinyan's favorite targets to smear. So if before the 2020 war, the public perception of Pashinyan was that of being one of Vazgen Sarkisyan's biggest detractors, I wonder what is Pashinyan's status vis-a-vis Sarkisyan after the 2020 war, and especially after 2023. Zunik, your thoughts? Well, Sparapet's birthday is uh, one of those reminders of what a unified nation can do in defense of its own interests. And uh, I don't know what goes into the so-called prime minister's mind when he visits uh, the grave and pays tribute, but I am sure he's not honest in his uh, attempts to show off the case and show as if he's respectful of all the uh, all uh, the efforts and all what Sparapet stands for, because uh, because of his efforts, we have lost Artsakh, which was greatly one of the successful uh, efforts of Sparapet in organizing the defense of Artsakh in starting from 1989 and later on managing to uh, gain victory against all, all odds. But uh, what now is being done is just simply a PR campaign of putting a check mark against the date of uh, simply showing off that he's respectful to his memory. Okay, let's um, get on with our first topic here. Over the course of the past week, Ararat Mirzoyan confirmed that the Armenian-Azerbaijani foreign ministerial meeting in Munich two weeks ago recorded no progress. This means that Armenia's relations with Turkey are also on pause because Turkish officials have repeatedly stated that any serious progress in Turkish-Armenian so-called normalization is dependent on meeting Azerbaijani demands. So what are those demands? In his interview with TRT, Ararat Mirzoyan spelled out some of those demands. He said that Azerbaijan refuses to recognize territorial integrity of Armenia based on Alma-Ata. He said that Azerbaijan wants a third force to be stationed along the corridors through Armenia that they are planning to use. Also, he said that Azerbaijan demands that Azerbaijanis should be able to crisscross Armenia to Nakhichevan without any pass passport, customs, or other related um, checks. Meanwhile, in the past, the meek responses that Armenia has suggested is that a non-Armenian company could be contracted to do border control. And other Armenian officials have suggested that there could be simplified procedures, whatever those may be for Azerbaijan, or that creative technologies could be found uh, to alleviate the concern of Azeris from seeing Armenians on their ride through Armenia. I mean, in some sense, if you don't want to see Armenians, you wouldn't come to Surreal. Armenia, but I don't yes. know what that means. Meanwhile, it, there was an interesting note also in his TRT interview, he stated, uh, this is Ararat Mirzoyan, he stated that no one can enter Armenia without registration, he said. Trying to piece all this together, it's unique. Um, what can we understand? Is Armenia trying to offer Azerbaijan a version of this so-called Zangezur corridor where Azerbaijanis can enter Armenia through some nominal registration system uh, where they don't see any Armenians? How is this supposed to work? Um, what's, what are your thoughts about this? 
Well, I would like to start from the failed negotiation stage that we saw a um, last effort to bring it back to life in Munich. Uh, it comes as no surprise as Azerbaijan got Artsakh fully depopulated from its original Armenian population. And now it's trying to gain uh, the so-called Zangezur corridor with the demand of actually no uh, control whatsoever uh, for the communication of Azerbaijanis between Azerbaijan proper and Nakhijevan. Uh, we have to understand the whole situation. Azerbaijan has a wash list of demands and it brings it as, as we go. And uh, there are two uh, instances that help them to fulfill their um, far-reaching goals. One is that uh, the West has certain plans for Azerbaijan, to which it has agreed before even the 2020 war. And part of these plans are to start military actions against Iran. And uh, Artsakh or Nagorno-Karabakh was promised to Azerbaijan as part of the benefits or bonuses that it will gain for the agreement to be part of this plan, putting its own territory as part of the military campaign against Iran, as we see it in Ukraine now. Huh? So uh, apparently our uh, government officials before 2020 have agreed to this plan and have fulfilled it, organizing the defeat of uh, uh, Artsakh in the 2020 war and the following steps that come logically falling into the same picture. Because giving territories which were not part of November 9 uh, declaration and then uh, attempting to justify uh, non-defense uh, actions while Azerbaijanis were coming and gaining positions uh, along the whole border of Armenia, and then actually uh, different kind of orders of not uh, shooting uh, while uh, standing at the border and protecting the border, which actually renders the military totally defenseless. And in certain cases, they were actually taken hostages uh, after those instances. So all this falls into the same picture of our officials being part of the plan, at least the ones sitting at the top being part of the plan. And we see the gradual implementation of this plan. So according to this plan, after, the, uh, after gaining Karabakh, Azerbaijan, and after so-called signing the peace agreement, Azerbaijan has immediately uh, the, to go start the implementation of the next stage of its uh, responsibility, which is to start the process against Iran. Huh? That's why we saw about a year ago, more than a year ago, the, uh, the situation uh, between Azerbaijan and Iran diplomatically going into a uh, actually adversarial stage huh? while, while the embassy was closed, etc., etc., and very uh, sharp uh, expressions being pronounced from the Azerbaijani side in order to uh, uh, bring the situation to a stage which will justify some kind of military action. Later on, right. after, after gaining immediately, almost immediately after the population of Nagorno-Karabakh, we saw Iran shifting towards Russia and uh, uh, we saw Azerbaijan shifting towards Russia and Iran and even going through a military exercises in the Caspian Sea so that it could kind of jump from one side to another and try to get out of the uh, agreements or uh, the part of the plan that it has to implement. So bringing up demands after demands is part of the same plan to delay the possibility of signing the peace agreement, meantime, gaining as much as possible. Huh? And in that instance, it uses the current uh, failure or the loose the losing situation in Ukraine, which puts the West into in a very Mm, a critical situation and they are trying to show 
some kind of success in all in some field, which is part part of which is the South Caucasus, but also to try to attempt to open a second front against Russia, which is also part of the same plan. So Azerbaijan has to play the game kind of attacking Armenia, which will put the Russian forces, which are supposed to protect Armenia as part of the bi both bilateral agreement or the collective security treatment. And Russia, by acting militarily, it kind of opens the second front, which will immediately um, uh, spread into Moldova, South, Central Asia, bringing the whole perimeter of Russia into a hot zones and uh, the uh, Russian military will have to spread thinly in, uh, in an attempt to protect its own borders. So this is the general plan or the idea that the West hopes will manage to implement, part of which is the Armenian uh, shift towards West and the current open uh, expressions of actually freezing the membership of the CST in the CST organization, uh, so-called uh, aspirations towards European Union membership, etc. Et this whole thing falls into the same picture. Now, Azerbaijan, with the help of Turkey, is trying to uh, make use uh, of the situation to its best and attempts to get what it can by bringing additional demands and trying to use the Western pressure over our government in order to get those concessions. So the picture you depicted with the Zangezur corridor is something that they have agreed long time ago, but because of the uh, criticism in the country, it was impossible to implement. Now tr they are trying to put it in a kind of a digestible manner for the Armenian population population, trying to show as if they are not agreeing to some kind of loss of uh, sovereignty over this, whatever, whether it's a road, a railroad or whatever, but they will give it to a third party to control it. And this third party control is definitely a Western so-called company about which I think uh, a year, more than a year ago, uh, the Minister of Economy, now under arrest, spoke about some kind of a Scandinavian company or a Swedish company. Right, I remember that. Uh, yeah, they, they will be in charge of the control of the whole area for the first uh, several uh, probably months and then gradually give it back to Azeris because Azeris will plan some kind of uh, some kind of a plan uh, for the demand to bring Azeri population back to Armenia. And so they then, will not stop. They will not stop. At never. This, they uh, will never yes. stop because now with the changing geopolitical situation, they know that the Western part is losing and they are trying to gain time for the whole situation kind of to clarify. And then they will gradually get out of this uh, uh promises that they have made to the west while jumping into this whole big right they will stop the agreement before any of their yeah. deliverables are the, the, uh, actual, so the situation will stop the agreement the necessity of fulfilling the agreement so this is their general plan and uh that's what they are hoping they will achieve but i'm not sure that will be successful because uh, first the west will never stop secondly Azeris will never stop and I think the only party still losing is Armenia and its population. Yeah. No matter who wins, Armenia loses. Right now, yes, because of the people sitting in the governing positions in, in my country. So at the same time as uh, Antalya was happening, the border commissions of the two countries also met. Apparently without any prior announcement and without any details released afterwards, other than a statement by uh, Azerbaijan, which I'll talk about more later. But what I wanted to draw your attention to is that this was in stark contrast to the previous meeting back in January when you know they said, oh, we're going to meet in two weeks. The time is not settled yet, but definitely by the end of January, we will meet. Um, at that time, Azerbaijan was saying that you know our only agenda for meeting is going to be to take our uh, so-called villages back. Uh, and at this time, all of a sudden, they met without any prior announcements. And the only thing that we know is Shahin Mustafayev from the Azerbaijani side um, uh, immediately after the meeting sent, 
laid out a demand, said that they want unilateral concessions of territory from Armenia even before the delimitation process starts. And they seem to indicate that Armenia will concede to these demands or else. Essentially, maybe a threat of violence is also included in there. Azerbaijan has blocked essentially all avenues of progress, such as refusing to agree on maps for these border discussions, yet saying that uh, progress depends on determining a border and refusing to return territories over uh, of over 31 Armenian villages that uh, Armenian authorities are themselves admitting are have been occupied by Azerbaijan since the 44-day war, uh, claiming actually that you know they're not occupying anything. So they're denying it because you know no uh, delimitation has taken place. But at the same time, there is no indication that Azerbaijan ever intends to release or relinquish those territories. Now, my question, I guess maybe this is a rhetorical question, given all that you have said so far, is why is Azerbaijan demanding unilateral concessions before the delimitation has started? Uh, is it acting as a good faith negotiator? No, definitely not. And we have to understand the whole situation in its complete uh, essence. Huh? So uh, after uh, the depopulation, uh, actually the ethnic cleansing in, in Arta, um, Azerbaijan is immediately shifted toward the Russian and Iranian side huh? and started acting uh, in a manner as if uh, refusing to negotiate in any of the Western formats. Then we saw certain uh, sticks uh, being shown from the Western side in the form of different resolutions and even discussions in the Congress of the Section 907, etc., which was kind of a, the uh, Western uh, threat being uh, presented to Azerbaijan that we will start using some kind of sanctions, which was natural for the West because it was losing the whole plan uh, as a result of the refusal of Azeri side to negotiate and sign the peace agreement that they have worked so hard to fulfill given the hardest concessions that the Armenian side has done, has made ever in, in probably our modern history. Uh, so uh, to avoid any kind of sanctions and loss of its reputation, Azerbaijan decided uh, to simply play the game. So they went into Munich with a negotiating agenda. And the, the uh, plan uh, for them is to bring up demands that will be extremely hard for any Armenian uh, to digest, to accept and kind of that will bring uh, resistance in the public and will be difficult for the uh, prime minister and the rest of the people who negotiate to agree to those demands. That's why we saw the demand for the new constitution and change of any reference to the declaration of independence and the rest of the list, as I said, a wash list of demands huh, that we, you, will, you will mark. Uh, and uh, the, the idea is to uh, bring new demands that will be very difficult or impossible for Armenia to agree. And in that case, Armenia will be blamed for, for actually failing the negotiations, huh? breaking the negotiations. And Azerbaijan will get out of the situation without any sanctions. It will say, well, uh, there, there's no hope. Uh, we were not the ones uh, stopping the negotiation. So now we see the game being played from both the Armenian side and the Azerbaijani side. Azerbaijan is bringing impossible demands to the table. Armenian side is simply going because they have nothing else to do. And then we see concessions being agreed and then uh, our public being played uh, to uh, by by false information by manipulation uh, of information in order to get some agreement from the public because if uh, our officials do not uh, do their part of the job then they will fall under sections from the western side so this is right. the whole situation we are currently in and we will see this going on for some time both sides yeah. are doing their part of the play it's like the role play being done and uh, the showcasing as if the Western negotiation uh, part is still alive. In actuality, it cannot deliver any result. Meantime, our public being 
terrorized by impossible demands that will actually kill our state and kill Armenia and depopulate Armenia from its own population. So we will see right. the same uh, ethnic cleansing being played around gradually uh, in Armenia, the economic situation getting worse, the uh, security situation getting worse. And Azerbaijan is using its current state uh, that it kind of controls the whole situation because everything depends on their uh, agreement to either go to the Western capitals to negotiate or to go to the border area to negotiate the border uh, mm -hmm. delimitation and uh, delineation and or agree to any kind of movement towards Iranian side to which actually the situation in Israeli Gaza uh, conflict is also dependent because this is also yes. part of the whole game. So currently Armenian population in Armenia and the Armenian statehood is hostage to this big geopolitical game which is played against the interests of the Armenian population. And our government is part of that game being played against us and against the possibility of Armenia to stay alive as a mm. viable state and to protect itself. Mm. Let me pose a naive question um, because Azerbaijan basically uh, is talking about those eight villages. You talked, you use the term kill, uh, it will kill our state, you know, the, the, some of the demands. So out of those eight villages, four are enclaves or three are enclaves. We have um, the Granashen, we have, and we have two enclaves in Davush. Um, yes. uh, but the four that Azerbaijan is demanding, they're saying, you know, well, Armenia can give us immediately all these non-enclave uh, territories. And I just wanted to uh, ask you for your assessment, how important are these territories for us? And why would, uh, you know, why can't we just sort of, you know, for in good faith, uh, you know, like, uh, like we gave away, you know, those trespass, you know, the, the criminal Azerbaijani soldier, you know, in good faith, just give more territory, uh, and so forth. Why, why are those four specifically those four villages that Azerbaijan is demanding right now, important? And do you think that Armenian authorities will actually dare to give those lands back, uh, you know, as Azerbaijanis demand right now? Well, I hope they will never dare to do that, because if they go for it, then uh, it will open the doors for our Armenian uh, being being actually occupied by Azerbaijanis, and I'll explain why. First, those four so-called villages. Uh, have no legal ground for being part of Azerbaijan. Hmm? They were simply administratively transferred for temporary use for the pasteurizing of the animals, the, the herds, and they have never been part of Azerbaijan. Uh, secondly, they are located in Tavus region, which is uh, the, currently the most protected in the defense line uh of of uh, the armenians uh, on the armenian side and if you open up the defense line it's like the whole area becomes defenseless and the besides uh the four enclaves that they are talking about part of them have never been part of again azerbaijan there are no legal grounds for that simply because the, the population there were gradually becoming more Azerbaijanis, they were transferred to the control of Azerbaijani SSR during the Soviet time. But in the beginning, there were no enclaves in, in Armenian SSR. And yeah. if we agreed to give these enclaves to Azerbaijan, they will demand sovereign passing through the Armenian territory to those areas. And it means you will not only give the enclave, but also the road to those enclave. And the road to those enclave, also the size of the roads that will have to be protected so that they have the safe passage. So uh, they will not bring the residents, they will bring military people to, to those enclaves. So you will have kind of military force in the, in the body of Armenia itself. Huh? So you will have kind of ulcer in your own body and also the connection to those enclaves held to be safeguarded 
either by some kind of forces or uh, by some kind of a corridor that will connect them safely to. So it kind of, you are yes. actually cutting through your own body besides the fact that these enclaves are sitting on our transportation veins, the main- Yes, that arteries, was what I was gonna get to. The main arteries that are connecting uh, us to Iran and Georgia. So in that way, you are actually cutting your own feeding arteries. And uh, I don't know what kind of a sensible, uh, official would agree to that kind of a, of a solution, especially when there are no legal uh, grounds for that. I'm also Besides, mystified as to how these issues can be added to the agenda willy-nilly. Why would you sit down and even talk about these things when they were not part of any kind of an I, agreement? Well, I agree. I, uh, I explained to you that now the two sides are playing the game of mm -hmm. not being the, the party that will be blamed for failing the negotiation. Well, there are other things that have not been agreed upon. Well, there are many things. that. Yeah, but so the just, main just talk about issues, those. Well, they are not talking. The thing is that the person who is sitting uh, as prime minister and representing Armenia has agreed to those things well before 2020. And now he has to deliver and he cannot get any security guarantees for himself unless he delivers what he has promised to do. These promises, we got the information as oral agreements. But they were not definitely oral, because if you start implementing immediately, according to some kind of a Google Maps, which nobody has uh, verified and agreed to what it represents, simply you just bring your borders into total or uh, ultimate non-protective state mm -hmm. and allows your en uh, enemy to simply walk through your border and come and get into your uh, leading positions uh, from which they can simply shoot your own population sitting right. in their houses, mm. then it means you are acting according to some prior agreement which, which makes Armenia totally defenseless. Okay. So given Armenia's actions to pivot towards the West, neighboring allies, Iran and Russia, have given Pashinyan's government increasingly strong warnings. The Armenian and Iranian defense ministers met this past week, and Iran reiterated that extra regional actors are not welcome in the South Caucasus. Iran itself has proposed in the past stationing monitors to replace the EU monitors on Armenia's borders. The Iran factor is obviously very important. Um, we can see that besides Suren Babigyan, over the past two weeks, there have been deputy prime ministers who've gone there, deputy foreign ministers who've gone there. So this is an important relationship to manage. Iranian officials have also been to Yerevan recently. And throughout all of these meetings, there is very repeated and consistent messaging. Don't bring outside people to the region. So something tells me that the frequency of these Armenian meetings to Iran are not necessarily about the close friendship between the two countries. Uh, what are your thoughts? What's being managed here? Well, my, my reading of the situation is that these frequent meetings, and we saw some time ago, even the, uh, what is that, Secretary of the Security Council? Armin going, Grigorian? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, going there, which was totally unexpected, given his standing in those positions and his approaches to Iran and uh, the whole situation. But in any case, my reading of the whole situation is that uh, these frequent visits are attempts to kind of appease the Iranian side, to calm them down and get some kind of an agreement for the opening of the Zangezur corridor with the Western control over it. So this is, this is the whole situation. And um, the thing is that this corridor would have been opened even during the 2020 war if it wasn't for our soldiers that uh, stood uh, steadily and did not allow the actually the military line to get to Armenia. And afterwards, we saw uh, with the uh, 2021 and then 2022 events that they were getting closer to kind of cutting through Armenia and opening those 
lines of communication between Azerbaijan and Nafi Javan. And we have to understand why it is so important for both the West and for Turkey and Azerbaijan. For the West, it is, the, it is very important because if they start military actions against Iran from the north, bordering Azerbaijani area, then they would need uh, land communication to transport the heavy military equipment through, mm -hmm. which they cannot do by uh, air, huh? by airplane. That's why they are so, so insistent on getting these lines open as the time goes, because according to their plans, it should have happened already in 2020 or 2021. And for Turkey and Azerbaijan, it, as they are playing their own game under the big Western uh, geopolitical plan, is to get the pan-Turkic idea in place. And they know once they get their feet in, then they will expand it, and then there was there will be no possibility to stop it. Mm -hmm. We saw, uh, I think it was in Antalya Diplomatic Forum that Toivo Klar, the EU representative, actually opened up the cards, stating that they expect Turkey to be the the control manager of the right. whole region of South Caucasus. A so this leader, is what they said. Legion, well, but that would mean the controlling party on behalf of the West. That is what the people, the analysts, the experts, and the opposition in Armenia has been stating all along. And this is something that comes as they gradually open up the cards, as Armenia uh, opens up its cards showing that it has actually moved to the West and it was uh, implementing the orders coming from the West. We see the West opening up the card in order to uh, show the situation and also to show that they are adhering to their initial plan, which was to put the whole region under Turkish control, uh, meaning that uh, or actually thinking that they will totally control Turkey, but they are very wrong in their mm -hmm. expectations. No one can control Turkey. Turkey will play not a double game, but it will play a triple or quadruple play, and it will have its own agenda fulfilled under it, and there will be no US or any other country in the world that will uh, actually force them to delinquish their own plans. Yeah. So this is something we have to be very fearful. Iran knows their neighbors very well, it knows what uh, the, any agreement would mean for its own country and for the for the wholeness of its own country. And it knows that the minute it agrees to any kind of Western presence on its northern, the only border that it, it is still safe for it to use, then it, was, it would mean encircling itself with Turkish elements and it would mean starting military actions on all of its borders, which will bring the country to a very, very devastating state. No country would like to see itself in this kind of a position. Right. Well, so there have been also foreign ministerial discussions between Mirzoyan and Lavrov. Yes. And uh, the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs has dangled both carrots and sticks in front of the Armenians, trying to get them to think a little bit harder about the situation. To all indications, these warnings are falling on deaf ears. We're not seeing the Armenian government cooperate <clears throat> appreciably with either Russia or Iran. What's the outlook on these relations going forward? Well, I don't see any uh, positive developments in that respect. The warning that the Russian side gave was get uh, give us a clear understanding of what your intentions are, because we, we, they have been, well, Russians have been cheated for too long for the last 20 years, especially from the Western side, and they know how these games are being played. Their warning with the whole uh, country, the population, the people who are able to think, they fully understand what the actual consequences, the devastating consequences of these actions would be. But the thing is, as I explained, that security guarantees, uh, the uh, high ranking officials of Armenia have got, uh, ha can get is only from the Western part. And in order to get those guarantees, they have to fulfill their initial agreements and uh, 
things that they have promised to do, they cannot get away with that. I hope that the situation, the geopolitical situation, the situation on the Ukrainian front will develop much faster and that will allow us to have the internal development in Armenia actually forcing the government to resign and then it will be up to Armenia and the uh, newly established Armenian government which will be acting in total agreement with the interests of Armenia and the Armenian people uh, change the situation and make uh, use of the opportunities that still are uh, available to us, mm. bring country back to its more normal uh, acting and uh, more trustworthy partner status that we have enjoyed during all of our independence years. Uh, except for this government or the people that uh, ruling uh, mm. group that is sitting uh, yeah. as, as representatives so, of Armenia. So in Antalya, um, Lavrov and Bayramov reiterated that the November 2020 trilateral statement is the appropriate basis for further negotiations. Um, what do the Russians have to offer in this situation. What are your thoughts about um, this kind of a uh, 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 proposal? Since there's not a lot left of that agreement, I mean, we've, we've talked that points one through eight have not been taken care of. So why are we talking about point nine all the time? Uh, well, point what can the Russians is... do? Essentially, I'm asking, is this a rational thing to continue um, stating and restating for the Russians? What are they gonna offer as mediator? Well, the interests of Azerbaijan and Russia in reiterating November 9 uh, are totally different. Huh? Uh, Azerbaijan is interested in November 9 because it is uh, about uh, opening of the corridor, more right. or less. Russia is interested in November 9 because it is uh, about control of the area by Russian forces, actually, and also about uh, peacekeeping forces being placed in Nagorno-Karabakh. But I'm sure that the minute there is an agreement about the opening of the corridor or the road or the railroad communication, whatever the first instance comes, Azerbaijan will immediately relinquish its uh, adherence to November 9 and then start totally acting on its own behalf, saying that as, as it said immediately, there is no Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. The issue is resolved. We solved it, and we have nothing to discuss. Mm -hmm. So this will be the same situation. It's just Russia, the only legal, though it's not legal document by itself, but the only legal document that it can refer to is November 9, and the consequent agreements that the three leaders of the countries uh, agreed to in January of 21 and then in uh, I think in May of 21 and this formed the whole uh, package of possible road of action or roadmap towards some kind of a solution but I would say that the only thing that can bring Armenia back to negotiation table under Moscow leadership is any kind of legal a form of return of Armenian population of Artsakh to Artsakh uh, under some kind of Armenian governance, governance there, which will also guarantee the Russian peacekeepers' presence in that area. Absolutely. But I don't think Azerbaijanis can agree to any kind of concession in that respect because they got what they couldn't have even dreamed for. Uh, but Junik, that their... would put them in the position of stopping the agreement. I mean, it would be very rational at this point to say, put 140,000 Armenians would... back no. in nagorno arapa let's talk. No, that won't put a uh, stop to the agreement because uh, that is also part of the agreement that they have to protect the population there. Right. That's why the peacekeeping force was uh, uh, positioned there. So by bringing, getting some kind of a legal uh, agreement or legal formulation for uh, bringing back the population, 
that would guarantee their continued presence there. But I don't Correct. think either Azerbaijan or Turkey would would wish to do anything once they got everything they wanted. Why? But would they from the perspective, anything? from the perspective of playing the game, that puts them in the position of stopping the agreement, right? Uh, you mean or Russia? the negotiations? No, no, uh, mean, the the Azeris. Azeris. If yeah, they cannot course, agree, they, then they say no and they stop talking. The, the usual manner of behavior or their pattern of behavior from the Azerbaijani side is they don't say that until they get the first, uh, they reach their first goal, which is opening up of the corridor. Once they reach the first goal, then they do some kind of a sabotage of the whole process. And then they start justifying uh, or bringing different kind of uh proposals in order to get away from the whole situation that's a normal behavior we're getting into these situations because in my opinion we have completely incompetent negotiators no we have very competent negotiations that they are acting according to the initial plan not actually uh protecting the Armenian interest or the interest of the Armenian state that's that's uh, very if you think, uh, of the whole situation as a normal Armenian, you wouldn't understand anything. That That is not logical. Any, any action that our government has taken does not fall into the same logic of fulfilling the Armenian interests or the interests of the Armenian state. If you go with the understanding that they are acting according to the prior plan, part of which was giving up Nagorno-Karabakh in order to bring the Western uh, party to our region, bring the whole South Caucasus under the Western umbrella, take, get the Russians out, uh, actually bring the situation to the state when you will start processes that will be uh, devastating or destructive for Iran and Russia, and that will be supportive of the whole Western plan of actually having a line of geopolitical control uh, going through South Caucasus towards Central Asia and beyond, then it is logical. Hey folks, uh, just a quick break from our program to uh, ask you to continue your support we love bringing you insightful content on Armenian news, politics, and culture, but we do need your help to reach a wider audience. And we're asking for your donations, uh, which will allow us to do four things. Number one, it'll help free up our time so that we can uh, you know, spend it on creating even better episodes for you and more episodes. Number two, we'd like to invest in design tools such as Canva so that uh, we can have nice eye-catching graphics. Number three, we'd like to do more SEO and social media promotion. And number four, we'd like to increase our video content creation capabilities. All of these will be significantly improved with your support. There are three ways to support Groom. Number one is Patreon, which is the preferred option. This provides a stable funding for sustainable growth. Number two is Buy Me A Coffee. It's also available on our website and you can uh, you know, make a one-time contribution to show us your support. And number three is YouTube Super Chat. So if you are on YouTube and watching this video or listening to this video, then you can uh, support us directly by sending a Super Chat with a monetary contribution. Your generosity is truly appreciated and it truly not only helps us reach a wider audience, but it gives us the signal that we're doing uh, important work and for it gives us the energy to continue. We promise all donations will go towards making Groom even better, and Groom continues to remain a all volunteer effort for Osbet and I. But we do need the extra help for, uh, you know, improving our reach. Thank you for being part of our journey. And our website is podcasts.groom.org uh, forward slash donate for donation options. Podcasts.groom.org slash donate. So uh, we. Initially, when we talked about Azerbaijan, it sounded uh, to me when I was planning, uh, it sounded like Azerbaijan is stalling things. But I just want to make sure that we don't uh, paint that uh, picture, because despite all these negotiation tactics and adding more conditions, 
uh, Azerbaijan is actively preparing for its goals and uh, they're arming themselves. We see uh, many new flights from Bulgaria, Israel, Turkey. Uh, just last week, Azerbaijan for a new military helped. action. Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. These are like armed, these are defense ministry uh, airplanes. And just last week, Azerbaijan held huge exercises um, and uh, military exercises in Afijawan. This is the sixth or seventh, I believe, large scale exercise. And just today, they just announced while we're recording this, they announced that they shot down an Armenian drone on the border. Um, so I just wanted to add that. Um, you know, caveat there that people should not think that Azerbaijan is simply okay with the status quo. Now, in the interview with TRT in Antalya, Mirzoyan said a few other things that I think are interesting that uh, underline the U-turn in Armenia's foreign policy. He said that Armenia is significantly deepening its relations with the EU and potential membership in the EU is also being discussed. I believe this has been the most clear statement from Armenian foreign policy officials to date, uh, indicating that Armenia is actually seriously considering requesting member EU membership, even though we got many different hints in the past. Um, and this is all in the backdrop of other moves Armenia has made, such as freezing its activity in the CSTO, threatening to leave the CSTO, and also inviting the Russians out of the Zavartnots airport, where they have uh, customs control duties uh, under an agreement, a bilateral agreement. In the past, Pashinyan has said that Armenia would develop its relations as closely with the EU as the latter deems possible. Uh, and there were also unconfirmed reports this week in Armenian media that Pashinyan has met with the civil contract team and informed them that they will need to submit an application to join the EU by the end of the year. So that's very interesting. We'll see how that develops. So things are moving fast. And uh, my question to you, uh, Zunik, is how do we decipher all of this? How likely do you think is actually Armenia's uh, potential request to officially join the EU this year? Well, as I explained the whole situation, the plan was to bring the South Caucasus total, the whole South Caucasus under the Western umbrella. And part of the whole process is EU because you cannot jump being a member of the CSTO, you cannot immediately jump into a NATO membership. So this EU membership is an intermediate step that has to be fulfilled. And, uh, you know, I don't know, but my belief is that this whole uh, talk will become useless in several months. Uh, I depict the EU uh, as the sinking Titanic. And I don't know why uh, our government is uh, uh, actually trying to run and jump onto the board of this sinking vessel when I don't think it will even survive the post-Ukrainian stage. So uh, whatever is being done will take time. And I think the geopolitical developments are speeding up to the actually rocketing to unbelievable stage. And I think the whole real politic will change the situation and the picture, which we cannot understand right now, because the social uh, upheavals in uh, Europe will change the picture. The elections that are going on throughout the whole major player countries will change the political picture in those countries and change the positioning of those countries. I don't think that by the end of this year, we will have the same talk because the situation will be different. But the question is, where will Armenia be and how right. complete it will be? Will it survive this whole situation? And if we manage to get rid of this government or this political party sitting on top of us and actually uh, cutting the branch that we are sitting on as a country and as people, yeah. uh, if we manage to get rid of them, then we will survive. If we don't, I don't know what yeah. what status we will be in. Uh, let me just address one more point that I think is worth bringing up and then we can close, uh, Zunik. Uh, Armenia's anti-CSTO gesturing apparently received some support this week from the UK of all places. Uh, James Hipney, Minister of State, which is under the Ministry of Defense, uh, said the following about Armenia's anti-CSTO moves. 
uh, and I'm quoting, the UK recognizes this decision as Armenia's sovereign right and will work with the Euro-Atlantic allies to support Armenia in the face of Russian threats of retaliation. Uh, and then he also adds, we will continue to work closely with Armenia to explore opportunities for closer cooperation. Uh, EU and Western officials in the past, I think, have been very nuanced about uh, not being able to provide security guarantees to Armenia. Uh, at least we haven't seen any overt statements other than this one that just recently popped up. Um, do you believe that this uh, is an anomaly or do you believe that the Western officials will now push more aggressive rhetoric against Russia and in support of Armenia's fight with Russia or sort of divorce with Russia, as you may uh, want me to call it? Well, uh, I, I think uh, the UK uh, statement is uh, representative of the policies that the West is carrying out. And uh, right now, when the US is too busy with its own election campaign, UK has taken UK has taken up the leadership, and we will see more and more of this kind of kind of leading positions coming from the UK. But being the UK, which has never played a positive role in our region, and has constantly uh, been anti-Russian in its policies, it is a big warning sign that we cannot expect anything good coming out of this whole thing. So uh, I would just uh, kind of simplify the whole thing is that, as I said, we see the uh, players coming out in, its, in their stances, being more clear in what their uh, interests and what their uh, far-reaching goals are for the region, for the countries, and for their own uh, geopolitical interests as a whole. So we see all the masks being uh, taken off, and we see the whole thing uh, coming out as clear as possible given the situation. There are no uh, hidden things for the people who can analyze and see the developments. And uh, as I stated, the only thing we have to manage is to uh, keep Armenia in one piece and keep Armenia as secure as possible before these geopolitical div divisions and developments will clear up the waters and we will see the things actually more clearly and uh, the situation will sta stabilize. Okay, for the interests of time, unfortunately, we have to wrap up our topics here. So I'd like to ask each of you if there's something on your mind from the past week that you would like to share. Uh, Juni, would you like to have uh, some thoughts well, shared? Well, I had a sad, sad uh, revelation for me last week, uh, a, a positive thing, but we brought a very sad uh, memories to my mind. We had the first um, concert of one of the Artsakh uh, uh, dance and actually the Artsakh state dance and song group uh, performance, the first performance after their coming to Armenia. And uh, when I looked at the concert hall, it reminded me of our community gatherings. And the thought was that actually we lost whole state and made the people of Artsakh a community, a simple community. It was so sad for me to see this thing and the sad looks, no, no, no shine, no bright look in the eyes of the, even the children. That was the saddest thing. Um, it was, it was good that these people had the strength to start performing again but it was very sad to see the whole thing and this revelation that a whole state, a whole people from their homeland, they became a community. Garut. Yeah. Yeah. They became I, Garut. I feel it for that saddest, as well. Yeah, the saddest thing for me to, to see. As an ambassador, I have seen that in many places, but to see that with Artsakh, it was really painful. Thank you. Hovig, what's on your mind? My comment, my comment, you know, people frequently ask, what could the diaspora do? Because we frequently appear to the diaspora. We say, you know, why is the diaspora so silent? And I'll give you just one example. 
uh, last weekend, I believe Sunday, uh, Archbishop Hovnan Derderian, whom I still respect, met with Lilith Malkunz. Uh, one time, she was the tutor of Nicole Pashinyan uh, in English, and today, she is the ambassador of Armenia to the U.S. So what could the diaspora do? You ask, you tell me. I mean, why did you express your dis dis dissatisfaction with uh, Archbishop Derderian about this meeting? I would like to ask Archbishop Derderian, if he's listening to this, uh, what was his reasoning to meet? And uh, what, was, uh, what uh, came out of that meeting other than photo opportunities and marketing material that was then distributed all over uh, state media and Nikol Pashinyan media? because I didn't see any strong statements from Ar Archbishop Derderian. And frankly, I'm at a loss. I, and this was effectively a normalization of meeting this regime, this collaborationist regime, this Turkish collaborationist regime. Uh, and the only benefit was just promoting the regime to me. So Archbishop Derderian, if you're listening, or if you uh, have the audience with Archbishop Derderian, please ask him for me, why did he meet uh, Derit Malkunz? All right, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Janyan, for joining us. Thank you, guys, again for Thank the you, opportunity. Ambassador. Okay, uh, we've been talking with Ms. Junika Janyan, who has served Armenia through the ranks of the foreign ministry, and most recently as a diplomat, as Armenia's ambassador to such countries as the Netherlands, Malaysia, and Indonesia. She received her education at the Yerevan State University, Columbia University in New York, and Uppsala University in Sweden. I'm Aspet Bedrosian. And I'm Hovik Manucharyan. Please find us on social media and follow us everywhere you get your Armenian news. The links are in the show notes. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Bye.